consideration at second reading of Bill of C-273, an act to establish a national strategy for guaranteed basic income, standing in the name of Ms. Zerowitz. Ms. Zerowitz, seconded by Mr. Easter, moves that Bill C-273, an act to establish a national strategy for a guaranteed basic income, be now read a second time and referred to the Standing uh, Committee on Finance. Debate. The Honourable Member for is it Davenport. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I got it right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm absolutely honoured to rise in this House today to speak to my private member's bill, Bill C-273, an act to establish a national strategy for a guaranteed basic income. My thanks to the member from Alpac who seconded the bill and who is a champion for a guaranteed basic income pilot in his home province of PEI. And a heartfelt thanks as well to the member for our Beaches East York, a true progressive who traded his spot so that I could stand in this house today to begin second reading of Bill C-273. I feel blessed to call him a colleague and a friend. Uh, Madam Speaker, basic income is not a new idea. It's one that has been circulating in Canada for decades. This bill is being introduced after many years of advocacy, research and work uh, of many leaders, including Professor Evelyn Farge, former uh, Minister, MP and Senator, the Honourable Hugh Siegel, Ron Hickel, who directed the MINCOM program in Manitoba, Sheila Regeer, Chair of the Basic Income Canada Network, uh, Floyd Marinescu, Executive Director of UBI Works, the Honourable Art Eggleton, former Senator, MP and Minister, Senator Kim Pate, among many other current Senators. I stand on all of your shoulders. Your work is the reason this bill exists. While there was a motion on basic income presented in this House by the member for Winnipeg Centre, Bill C-273 represents the first time a bill on basic income has been introduced in the House of Commons, and it's a true honour for me to speak at the second reading of this bill. Madam Speaker, we are slowly coming out of a once-in-a-generation pandemic, and we're all wondering what kind of world we want to come back to. I think we're all asking ourselves questions about how do we want to live, inquiring about some of the models and systems that are currently in place. We're looking with new eyes at the economic model that has been the foundation of global growth. We have a much better understanding of the human impacts of our planet that's accelerating climate change and asking ourselves how we can change the way we live. We see more clearly the disproportionate impact of the pandemic and other global disruptors on the most vulnerable and ask what is our obligation to those that are less fortunate than we? In building back better, what is the world that we want to live in? As we chart a course forward, I believe we need a 21st century approach that provides stability and better supports Canadians, tackles income inequality, enhances productivity, and spurs economic growth and innovation. Bill C-273 proposes to create a new model that would serve as the foundation of our social welfare system. The bill at its core is about enabling implementation pilots between provinces and or territories and the national government to test large-scale guaranteed basic income programs. This bill is not about testing whether or not basic income is a good idea. There's already strong and substantial data that supports the effectiveness of guaranteed basic income, but there's much less information on the best ways or models to implement and deliver basic income at scale. Bill C-273 enables us to test, to frame, test, and validate different models to get to those answers and the data. The, the results of these implementation pilots and data would ultimately be used to create a national guaranteed basic income model. The bill does not propose which basic income model to use, whether it's a negative income model or the Ontario model or the Mincom model or any other model. It also does not articulate a price tag or propose to eliminate any existing government assisted uh, uh, income or support uh, programs. Bill C-273, if passed, would have all these details worked out between provinces and or territories and the federal government. It allows for interested provinces or territories to model and create a program that works best for their population. This bill would also collect data in three key areas, the impacts to government, the impacts to the recipient, and the impacts to recipient communities. And it also proposes the creation of a framework of national standards. 
So Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker, why am I proposing a bill on guaranteed basic income? Canada's current social welfare system, created in the 1940s, modernized in the 1970s, is still largely uh, the foundation of the system we have today. And no matter how many times it's adjusted, still too many Canadians are falling through the cracks. There are literally hundreds of income and support programs for, for Canadians delivered by dozens of departments and ministries. This complexity leads to our current service model missing many of the, of the Canadians most in need and focuses too often on applications and auditing Canadians and far less so on delivering the actual support that they need. Meanwhile, even with these programs, income inequality continues to grow despite our deliberate efforts to tackle it. And I just want to state I'm so proud of the many ways our federal Liberal government has tried to directly address income inequality and reduce poverty over the last five years, such as raising taxes on the top 1%, reducing it on the middle class, introducing the Canada Child Benefit, increasing the Canada Worker Benefit, uh, increasing the guaranteed income supplement for seniors, among many other things. We have greatly reduced po poverty in Canada by over a million, but income inequality continues to be an issue. So I believe it's time to review the foundation of our social welfare system and bring it into the 21st century. I believe that a new service model could a new service model could be a guaranteed basic income program, one that may simplify our social programs while better delivering support. Even before the pandemic, almost half of all Canadian families were $200 away from coming up short on their monthly bills. The jobs they rely are, uh, on aren't what they used to be. People used to turn to part-time and temporary work as a last resort during tough times. But now, for many, multiple jobs are needed to pay the bills and meet responsibilities. And indeed, Madam Speaker, the world of work is changing faster than ever before. More workers are shifting to the gig economy. There are more temporary and short-term jobs. And many jobs, whether it's blue collar or white collar, are being eliminated by automation and artificial intelligence. In addition, disruptions in our economy are happening at an accelerated rate, faster and more frequently, leaving more Canadians working harder, longer, and feeling like it's more difficult to get ahead. All through history, humans have had to adapt to major disruptions like the ones we're going through now, COVID, the move to digital economy, among many others. And we eventually do adapt, but the period of change can be harsh, even ruthless, leaving countless workers behind with many never recovering. Our social safety net is not well designed to help Canadians through transitions. So in my opinion, we need a new model, one that provides stability to those who've been trapped in a cycle of poverty, to those who are in danger of falling into poverty, and to the middle class threatened by disruption. Workers can't weather economic change without a strong financial floor under them that provides them with stability. Too many jobs no longer provide that floor. Low wage work prevents people from moving on to better opportunities. People can't take time to train for tomorrow's job market or turn an idea into business that employs other people. People need financial freedom to move up the economic ladder and innovate. Young people understand this volatile future because they're already living it. They know the guarantees made to them no longer hold true. We promised them a middle-class lifestyle if they got an education, worked hard. Instead, they're inheriting an economy facing nonstop stop disruption. They're being forced into a gig economy and temporary jobs or facing threats from automation. We need a social welfare system that is more responsive, less complex, more flexible, and is better at managing labor changes, disruptions, and transitions. A basic income program can offer that. Finally, I see guaranteed basic income as a cornerstone of Canada's innovation economic growth strategy. Equal opportunity for everyone to succeed is a fundamental value at the heart of Bill C-273. We need a system that removes all obstacles to the, to the access to opportunity and to allow people to be their best selves. Canada's economy and success will be dependent on our ability to innovate. The only way for Canada to achieve its economic potential is by allowing all Canadians to achieve their full personal potential. Madam Speaker, it is vital to note that the operational design of a basic income program is critical to its success. Ron Hickel, director of the Mincom Manitoba program, said that there are three essential design features of a system that will provide sufficient income and address variability of income, greatly encouraging work, minimizing fraud, and reducing public costs. So the design of any basic income 
uh, model or implementation pilot must be thoughtful and guaranteed uh, income uh, and guaranteed income implementation pilots should be monitored and adjusted as they unfold to ensure they are producing the impacts that are desired. There are three common, often repeated myths, myths around basic income. One is it will encourage people to stay at home and not work. Two, social programs that are helpful will be eliminated. And three, it will cost too much. Basic income pilots have been tested all over the world. Beyond our borders, count countries such as Japan, Finland, Iran, and the United States have all tested it. And the verdict? A basic income it helps reduce poverty without reducing people's desire to work. Some people find that last part hard to believe, even though basic income recipients and pilots around the world show that they continue to work. That's because most basic income models wouldn't cover all of your costs, but would provide the stability needed to improve your options. Recipients of basic income do not see it as a handout, but a resource with which they use to retrain, go back to school, or search for full-time work. And when they do, they often find better work, earn more, and stay in jobs longer. As for the costs, some people believe that the price tag is too, too big. Real life has shown us that the cost of doing nothing is bigger. What is the cost of not altering a system that we know is outdated? What is the cost of not better supporting Canadians to be their best and more productive selves? In the end, it may be cost effective in pilot, if pilots generate more value than it costs. Before the pandemic, our social safety net was already failing. The pandemic just pointed a, a spotlight at it. In the months ahead, pandemic supports will start winding down. Families will go, ba will go back to hoping their limited monthly savings are enough to get by on. My sense is that we know that they won't be. So Madam Speaker, we're faced with some big questions as we come out of this pandemic and as we tally up the costs and face the hard truths that have come to light over the last 16 months. The late Shimon Perez, former president and prime minister of Israel at a World Economic Forum in Davos in 2014 said that the world is changing faster than ever before, but the opportunity before us is to shape the world that we want to live in. So what is the world that we want to live in? In Canada, what kind of society do we want to create? Mark Carney tells us that the crisis facing the world today comes from a focus on price and profitability at the expense of fairness and income inequality. Recognizing that our current uh, models have not resulted in a fairer, more equitable world, what are the right values for Canada, Canada to pursue now? Maybe one, we want to create a base set of principles that is at the root of our society, that every Canadian has access to food, a roof over their head, Healthcare, freedom from violence, greater choice, and full access to opportunity. Maybe we want to balance making policy decisions that look only at improving productivity, efficiency, and creating jobs with also providing Canadians with stability, dignity, and personal growth that will have greater success in achieving those goals. Maybe we want to create a new foundation for our social welfare system, one that provides stability, dignity, and the right incentives for every Canadian to be supported so that they can contribute as their best selves. And Madam Speaker, we have done this before. After the Depression and World War II, a compassionate Tommy Douglas imagined universal health care for all the men and women, many of whom he was seeing in the streets, many who had served in the war, but who coming home could not afford health care. And they, be, they, were, had, they had become destitute. He had imagined free health care services for all. And starting in one province, he showed that it could be done and how best to do it. We then expanded health care to the rest of Canada. And we are not poor as a country. We were richer for it. We also did this with public pensions and old age securities for seniors. Again, we are a better, richer and fairer country because of these programs. So in conclusion, Madam Speaker, the world is in transition now, and it's a moment that we need our governments to step up and to create the world that we want to live in. This is that moment. Our aging social infrastructure is ill-suited to support the needs of Canadians today. Too many people no longer have a fair shot at opportunity. Creating a new model that provides stability can restore a fair shot for everyone and boost our innovation and economic potential. A guaranteed basic income, as would be enabled by Bill C-273, is the simplest, fastest, and most effective way to get it done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions et commentaires, questions and comments. L'honorable député de Thérèse de Blainville. Bonjour et merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I listened closely to my colleague's speech. 
not so much about the substantive content of this idea about a guaranteed basic income, but the idea of a pilot project with the provinces. Now, I won't talk about the substance of the issue because there are advantages to a guaranteed basic income. But what I would like to comment on is that this seems to be something that should belong to the provinces to do. When it comes to these kinds of things, social programs, well, that's something that's under provincial jurisdiction. So my question is the following. I'd ask my colleague whether Instead of reflecting on these conditions for the 21st century, instead the government could do two things immediately for workers. First of all, strengthen the EI system, and secondly, for seniors not discriminate between different groups of seniors and increase OAS from 65. For Davenport? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Speaker, and through you, I want to thank the Honourable Member for her excellent question. So there's two things I, I want to address. The first is, in terms of keeping uh, adjusting our current uh, EI system, as I mentioned in, uh, in my speech, uh, it was a system that was created in another era, and it was meant to actually serve a population with uh, and a time with different challenges and opportunities. For me, I don't think that it doesn't matter how many times we actually adjust the system, still too many people can't actually access the supports, still too many people are falling into poverty, and we don't have the agility and flexibility in the system that we need uh, for the unpredictability of the work world that we see both today and in the future. In terms of the, um, uh, the participation of the provinces, uh, federal uh, support uh, programs Sorry, uh, support programs are actually offered both provincially and federally. And I think. Fortunately, I do have to allow for other questions. There's only five minutes for questions and comments. Uh, questions de commentaire, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to congratulate my colleague on her private member's bill and, and advancing the idea of basic income. However, leading, as we know, leading uh, basic income efforts have indicated that basic income is actually not a silver bo bullet, and it must be in addition to current and future government services and supports. My concern is with Article 3D1, uh, which provides uh, the option of, in quotes, the potential of a guaranteed uh, basic income program to reduce the complexity or replace existing social programs. And I have to say my concern was amplified last week on June 7th when the member for Davenport voted in support of reducing the CRB from $2,000 to $1,200 uh, come, come July in the FINA committee. Um, a totally unlivable income. Is the member willing to make amendments to her bill to ensure that cutting our social safety net is off the table? Honourable Member for Davenport. Uh, thanks so much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for uh, her question for her, her leadership on this issue as well. So there's two things I will address. One is, in terms of the what uh, support programs would actually be included in any type of basic income implementation pilot, the, the bill doesn't actually call for any programs to actually be reduced. I think it's just gathering the data as to what would be reduced if there are any programs that are flattened over time. So it really is up to the provinces and territories to work with the federal government to come up with a pilot uh, for its citizens. And the principle should be that everyone is better off. In terms of what you're referring to in finance committee, there was a proposal uh, to actually uh, increase uh, CRB, but it was actually ruled out of order be uh, because uh, because it's a technical thing that, that doesn't allow sort of motions to come before finance committee that would actually increase uh, the budget. Uh, we have time for a brief question. The our member for Cape Breton can, so a brief question, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member of Davenport on our important work on Bill C-273. So in my writing of Cape Breton Canso, health care is top of mind for uh, all constituents. Can you tell us about the relationship between basic income and social determinants of health and how basic income can reduce the strains on our health care system? Yes, and I do want to remind the member he's to address the questions directly to the chair and not the individual member. A brief answer from the member for Davenport. 
Uh, well, so I want to thank the honourable member for, for his excellent question. Uh, and through you, Madam Speaker, I want to thank him for, for his uh, tremendous support and leadership as well. Um, what I would say is the reason we want to have these types of implementation pro, pro, uh, pilots is because you want to actually test how is it that we could better support our populations in an area in, in an era that is changing faster than ever before. So we know that the current costs of poverty, the current costs of, of not providing uh, enough support to our population uh, does have uh, negative effects on, on health. And so I think that is the reason we want to be testing out these types of implementation uh, pilots moving forward. Thanks so much, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the honorable member for Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's uh, very good to be back on the floor of the House of Commons. Like so many parliamentarians, I've been participating virtually for months, so it, it really feels great to be here today with you and with everyone in the House. And I'm pleased today to put some thoughts on the record concerning Bill C-273, an act to establish a national strategy for guaranteed basic income. So what is a guaranteed basic income? Well, there are many different policy iterations of it, but on the whole, it would essentially be monthly checks to every Canadian. And some of the policy iterations of this would provide basic checks to children as well. And the amount tends to vary depending on the plan and some having a few hundred dollars a month and others that see it more providing as a, as a means to cover all basic necessities like CERB, which was of course $2,000 a month. So in simple terms, a guaranteed basic income is like CERB, but for everyone forever. And the parliamentary budget officer has estimated that a national guaranteed basic income could cost $85 billion per year, rising to $93 billion per year in 2025-2026. And to pay for this at the federal level, Canadians could expect to see a tripling of the GST that currently sits at 5% or increasing personal in income taxes to 50%. And introducing a basic income following the costliest year in Canadian history where federal government spending hit $650 billion in 2020 and is predicted to hit $510 billion in 2021 is cause for concern especially since we've received really no viable, tangible strategy of how the Liberals are going to raise enough revenue from taxpayers to responsibly pay back the $354 billion of deficits from 2020 or the $154 billion of deficits predicted for 2021. And to think, Madam Speaker, it was just six short years ago that the federal budget was a mere $298 billion. And the Liberals have doubled Canada's national spending during their time in office. And now they want to talk about adding another $93 billion permanent spending program to the bottom line. And I think Canadians are reasonably concerned about this. But the basic income proposal is more than about spending, of course. We know it's uh, essentially one of the main arguments is to address poverty. And policy proponents argue that uh, the benefits to the country's social fabric, fabric will outweigh the costs. And in 2019, Statistics Canada estimated that 3.7 million Canadians, or one of 10, live below the poverty line. And a 529-page report, quite a lengthy report, by researchers and economists at three leading Canadian universities concluded after a three-year investigation that a basic income would not be the best way to address poverty. Rather, the report found that government should focus on improving existing programs that are already targeted to those who really need them. For example, help with rental assist or to youth aging out of the child welfare system or perhaps Canadians living with disabilities. And proponents of the basic income argue it will help those living at the extreme inequalities in Canada, those that are homeless, for example. And often we know that those who suffer from homelessness also suffer from severe addictions, with the two often feeding into one another. But I have grave concerns with the impact of basic income on Canadians suffering from addictions. And we know COVID-19 has had severe, extreme, and deathly outcomes in Canada since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And in fact, overdoses have killed more people by far than COVID-19. In Toronto, fatal suspected opioid overdoses calls, uh, calls into paramedics were up 90% in 2020. And in Manitoba, 372 overdose deaths were recorded last year, which is a full 87% jump from the year prior. And in British Columbia, the latest data tells us that an average of five people die every single day from illicit drug overdoses, with 500 people having died in the first three months of 2021 alone. And in fact, Canada-wide, in the six months following the implementation of the COVID-19 lockdowns and restriction measures, there were 3,351 apparent opioid toxicity deaths, representing a 74% increase from the six months prior. A truly devastating statistic, Madam Speaker. So now, what happens if you send a monthly check of thousands of dollars to those who are severely addicted to drugs? 
Well, when CERB was first introduced, a constituent of mine, a mother, called me in desperation, desperation, terrified that her adult son, who was unemployed and didn't qualify for CERB, would apply for CERB, get it, and have a severe and possibly deadly relapse. Frontline workers confirm this fear, like those at Winnipeg's Main Street Project, who have said they believe that CERB has hiked drug use and contributed to opioid abuse and addiction. This is a real concern about basic income that I have, and I really haven't heard a coherent solution to address it. And it is difficult to break out of the poverty cycle. We know this, Madam Speaker. The data tells us that once a person has been unemployed for more than a year, it can be extremely difficult to rejoin the labour market, and it can create a dependency on social programmes and a disincentive to work. In this sense, a basic income could create a permanent underclass in Canada. And importantly, Madam Speaker, there is an inherent dignity in work. But MPs are hearing from small businesses in our communities across Canada, particularly in service, the service industry and the construction field, that it is more difficult now than ever to hire workers, that prospective employees are opting to stay home on government emergency support programs rather than going to work. Now, millions of Canadians are, of course, working and taking whatever work they can find, but some are not. And we know working and earning an income provides both economic and social benefits. It's necessary to provide for oneself and one's family and also boosts confidence through earned satisfaction of a paycheck. It provides purpose, builds personal responsibility, personal growth, perseverance. It provides daily structure, you know, a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And it really, we know it contributes to our personal identities. We, you know, many people say, I'm a nurse or I'm a truck driver or a scientist or a small business owner. It's part of who we are. And as Sean Spear said in the National or Financial Post uh, a few years ago, quote, work is one of those crucial activities and institutions that underpins the good life. Recently, um, my grandfather passed away, and he was 91 and born in the prairies uh, of the last pioneer generation in Canada. There were very few government support programs in his early days, and CERB and public health care were unheard of at the time, and people really simply had to work very hard every day or they wouldn't eat. Now we have developed a kinder, more compassionate society that takes care of people when they fall on hard times, and that's very good. My grandparents' generation built the strong, prosperous country that allows for this type of public generosity in Canada. However, near the end of his life, my grandfather remarked, sometimes to him it seemed young people feel a sense of entitlement uh, to an easy life of comfort, free from struggle. And as a young person, I, I do get that sense as well. And last year, when CERB was first introduced and the Liberals were creating a student version of it, it happened to be at the same time that our country's food resources were at risk. And every year, Canada brings in about 40,000 temporary foreign workers, generally from Central America, to uh, work in our agriculture sector um, to produce the food that feeds Canadians and, in fact, feeds the world. But with the border closures, it was very difficult to get these workers in, and our food supply chains were at risk. And now, with tens of thousands of service sector jobs uh, in tourism, hospitality, and the restaurant and bar industry closed, many students who relied on that work for summer employment, I used to be one of them, uh, did not have, obviously, these same opportunities. So conservatives suggested at the time, just over a year ago, you know, why not have able-bodied young people full of energy work as a temporary measure in our agriculture sector? Picking fruit, working in the fields, living on farms for the summer, contributing to the COVID effort, and really securing our food supply chains. But this proposal was met with quite a bit of apprehension, to say the least. Um, and in fact, when I consulted university student leaders during committee on this idea, one student said, and um, I will never forget this quote, we go to university so we don't have to do those jobs. That's what she said. And this quote was coming from a student who was at a committee uh, meeting asking for government handouts um, for students. The student benefit was important and I'm glad it was provided. However, I found these comments very discouraging, not just for the younger generation, but for what was implied, that a labor job or an entry level job with limited uh, requirements for complex skills or education was somehow not respectable, or those uh, jobs were beneath certain Canadians, notably some student university elites apparently, who looked down their noses perhaps at an honest day's work in the sun. And really, what does that message send to those aspiring to break into the job market at the bottom of the ladder or the millions of Canadians who are having to work at minimum wage jobs? You know, I was one of them, and I worked in dozens of these types of jobs, in restaurants, retail, manual labour. I've done them all, and I'm a better person for it. And it taught me the value of hard work. It shaped my work ethic and character. I learned many valuable skills that really carry me today. And I could go on about the value of working part-time since I was 14, on and off, uh, has added to my life. And we know that there's no better way out of poverty than getting a job, um, and even when you have to start from the bottom. 
The experience and skills and social socialization are ultimately unmatched. So in conclusion, Madam Speaker, that's why the Conservatives and the Leader of the Official Opposition, the Member for Durham, are focused on jobs recovery plan from the economic destruction of the COVID-19 pandemic. Priority number one for a federal, federal Conservative government would be to recover and create one million jobs and get every industry in Canada firing on all cylinders and leaving no demographic or region of the country behind. And meanwhile, the Liberals are here today to talk about basic income, uh, more money for everyone forever, and really we know that's not a jobs plan. It's certainly not an economic recovery plan. And Conservatives want to create an inclusive economic recovery that will build a stronger Canada with more opportunities for everyone so that they can succeed in the job, job market and not need to collect you know, checks from the government every month. And that is our focus and will be our number one priority should we form government after the next election. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate. The Honourable Member for Joliette. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I want to uh, acknowledge the member for Davenport who brought forward this bill. She's uh, a bill that we really appreciate on the finance, uh, a person that we really appreciate on the finance committee. Now, when I was studying economics, I remember that the great unionist Michel Chartrand had published a book book about minimum income with Michel Bernard. I found it to be a really interesting idea. And I was surprised to see that this concept was also defended by the right wing, having been promoted by the father of neoliberalism, Milton Friedman. We had a lot of conversations about this concept uh, with my teachers and classmates at the time. So whatever it's called, guaranteed minimum income, basic income, universal allowance, living wage, this minimum basic income will be on the agenda in many countries in the coming years. Uh, both in Quebec and Canada and internationally. And there are two reasons for this. On the one hand, there's been an extraordinary accumulation of wealth in advanced societies in the hands of a few individuals. So this requires redistribution. And on the other hand, there's been an extraordinary increase in job insecurity that comes along with insecurity, poverty, and misery. In Canada, the richest 1% hold 10% of the wealth, while more than one third of the workforce is in non-standard employment. The social safety net no longer protects people who are self-employed or working part-time or in temporary jobs. This pandemic has proven that in employment insurance uh, will collapse at the onset of the crisis uh, and inequality will increase. Various social programs, and particularly EI and social assistance, do not provide the minimum social protection that our fellow citizens deserve. So it's no surprise that workers with a precarious status um, are very tempted by the uh, minimum basic income, which would be paid to them without all the red tape of some of the existing programs. However, this generous vision of uh, wealth redistribution is opposed by another vision, one of guaranteed minimum income, uh, which is promoted by the champions of neoliberalism. This would be just enough money to live on, in exchange for dismantling current social protections. Once again, the benefit of such a policy depends on how it's done. As they say, the devil is in the details. Madam Speaker, support for individuals and families is the responsibility of Quebec and the provinces, not Ottawa. Let's take an example. So what would be the consequences of letting a program be managed by Ottawa instead of Quebec? In 1940, Quebec ceded jurisdiction over unemployment insurance to Ottawa through a constitutional amendment. Through a series of reforms, unemployment insurance lost its original purpose. If insurance collapsed at the onset of the crisis when it was most needed, well, we can also say that uh, EI wasn't playing its role uh, before the pandemic either. Barely four out of ten people who were unemployed were actually eligible for benefits. Among women and young people, it was barely a third. And that's in addition to uh, temporary and part-time employment. So various governments in Ottawa have turned EI into a hidden tax by uh, dipping $59 billion into its coffers and depriving people who are unemployed. Quebec accepted a constitutional amendment and Quebec or rather, Ottawa hasn't played its role. It's betrayed us. Many social programs, other than EI, are, Quebec, are based in Quebec. So we've got our own social insurance program, QPP, child benefits, disability benefits, and so on. 
In Quebec, having a guaranteed minimum income would require a major undertaking. Because there are so many programs that were adopted from the 1960s onwards, they would be very di difficult to dismantle uh, in favor of a single universal policy. And, that, and dismantling those programs could disadvantage many people who currently receive assistance. Now, just because it's complex doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but I think we should be fully aware of how, how difficult it would be. We should also consider everyone who might be affected by such a change, like seniors, single mothers, people living with disabilities, and so on. And given Canada's federal structure, you would need a lot of federal-provincial cooperation, and that's always a huge challenge. As we know, in the best uh, case scenario, Ottawa will cooperate with these programs, as it did with the new child care program, but it has an unfortunate tendency to go back on its commitments. Again, we, I could refer to EI or health care. In fact, uh, Ottawa often doesn't keep its word. You just ask Indigenous people. If Quebec wanted to have a minimum basic income, it would have to repatriate the EI program. But as Henri Brun, constitutional scholar, said um, at the National Employment Insurance Review Commission, the federal government's exclusive jurisdiction over EI could not be transferred to the provinces, or to Quebec in particular, without a constitutional amendment. And that would have to be obtained first uh, through the agreement of seven provinces representing more than 50% of the Canadian population. So good luck with that. In reality, implementing uh, a basic income or even a more uh, a lower income would require the collaboration of both levels of government. And we already have this very complex web, web of social assistance and social insurance measures, uh, and not to mention, of course, the major implications it would have for the tax system. So if we were to change this, it would mean expanding and even trampling on uh, Quebec's constitutional jurisdiction. Of course, there have been a lot of such um, interferences in the past. Does the Liberal Party really want to reopen the Constitution? Because that's what would need to be done. And again, we would need the uh, agreement of more than seven provinces and 50% of the Canadian population. La santé. Bien qu'elle soit de compétence provinciale, ça n'a pas empêché Ottawa d'intervenir en vertu du pouvoir de dépenser que lui reconnaît la Constitution canadienne. En 57... In 1957, the federal government passed the Medicare Act, promising to cover 50% of the costs of provincial and territorial health care systems while providing coverage to all residents. In 1966, the federal government passed a new piece of legislation promising to cover half the costs. And what's the situation today? Federal transfers that used to represent 50% of the funding for health care in the 70s now is around 18 percent because Ottawa decided unilaterally to use a new method of calculation linked to GDP growth, which deprived Quebec of billions of dollars. And we know that this means that crumbs are given to the provinces and with strings attached. This is predatory federalism, according to the previous Liberal government in Quebec's health minister. The federal government has also changed its rule for distributing these funds among the provinces. It's prorated now on a per capita basis, and Quebec has an older population. Older people use health care more than younger people, so the government of Quebec calculates that this new, according to its calculations, the new rule deprives Quebec of $174 million this year and over $2 billion for the next 10 years. Everything suggests that this will be the same in the, in the foreseeable future. So Ottawa should in order to put in place a minimum guaranteed income to allow people to live in dignity, we would have to reopen the Constitution. We would have to establish a new deal between Canada, Quebec, and the provinces to replace current social programs like EI, the GIS, and 
pension payments, pension benefits, child benefits, and so on. We also would need to make sure that everyone affected by this change would not be put in a worse situation than they are now. It would also require uh, trust in Ottawa to keep its promise and not to chop this program after a few years. And Ottawa has never kept its word before, has never proven itself worthy of trust in, measuring social, in, in uh, managing social benefits. The Bloc Québécois finds this idea of a guaranteed income uh, and a good one, but not if it's run by Ottawa Knows Best. It should be run by Quebec, and that's basically a mission impossible in this federation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to start out by congratulating uh, my honourable uh, colleague, uh, member from Davenport, for her private member's bill. Because we know what we've learned during the pandemic is that our social safety net is patchwork and it's insufficient. And this isn't an accident, Madam Speaker. This capitalist economy of Canada leaves those behind who do not fit into its economic agenda. And who is being left behind, Madam Speaker? Disabled persons, people with complex mental health and trauma, people who are unhoused and living rough, unpaid work, care work, seniors, veterans, students, and the list goes on. And I think, Madam Speaker, it's important to, to note that we cannot understand the poverty that we are experiencing today outside of race, gender, racism, ableism, colonization, and the violent dispossession of land from Indigenous peoples. To do otherwise is a futile exercise of washing over the ongoing white supremacy of racism that support inequalities and inequities in the present. And we know that when you provide people with an income guarantee, Madam Speaker, along with wraparound social supports, it's a cost-saving measure. It's good economics to look after people. And what we found, Madam Speaker, is that during COVID-19, with the creation of a Canada Emergency Response Benefit, we have seen that a basic income is both possible and feasible in this country. There is no reason, no reason, Madam Speaker, why anyone should live in poverty in Canada, and it comes at a very, very high cost. In fact, the World Health Organization has declared poverty to be the single largest determinant of health. And there is a direct correlation between poverty and high rates of incarceration. According to federal data, in fact, the John Howard Society has shown that the annual cost per prisoner in federal prisons is about $115,000 a year for one person. The MMIWG final report, the commissioners found that about 80% of Indigenous women who are incarcerated are incarcerated for reasons related to poverty-related crimes and therefore included. It is not surprising that in the report, they included a demand for a guaranteed livable basic income. And the parliamentary budget officer did a careful breakdown, in fact, between 2011 and 2012 and found that each Canadian pays $550 in taxes per year on the criminal justice spending. Don't you think that this money would be better invested in looking after people to make sure that people have what they need to ensure that we can all live in dignity, creating lasting and meaningful plans that use human rights frameworks to address poverty would be costly up front, but not as nearly as expensive as doing nothing. And there has been so much research that has already been done, study after study after study to prove this. In fact, in 1970, in the Dauphin Mincom study, which was one of the most ambitious social science experiments ever in Canada, 
it saw a decrease in hospitalizations, improvements in mental health, and a rise in the number of children completing high school. The Ontario basic income pilot or income pilot, uh, the most recent study found that participants of the Ontario basic income pilot project were happier, healthier, and even continued working, which goes against all arguments that when you look after people, it's a deterrent to working. Study after study, pilot after pilot, even though we know the results as mentioned by my honorable colleague, the member from Davenport, guaranteed income programs have great results. And Madam Speaker, Basic income is a way forward in lifting millions of Canadians out of poverty and empowering them to make their own choices. Basic income, in fact, Madam Speaker, would give workers leverage. No one would be desperate to take a job offered at any wage anymore, as we saw with migrant workers and meat packing plants across Canada during the pandemic. Companies operating without adequate safeguards, despite warnings from health experts creating breeding grounds for the COVID-19 virus. A basic income would mean not having to put up with degrading work as people could be in, in a better place to refuse a job offer. This would put the power back in the hands of the workers, giving them the power to walk away from abusive work situation. And although basic income is not a silver bullet, Madam Speaker, it would save lives in many cases, and it would heed the calls to justice in the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, Call to Justice 4.5, which states, in quotes, we call on all governments to establish a guaranteed annual livable income for all Canadians, including Indigenous peoples, to meet all their social and economic needs. This income must take into account diverse needs, realities, and geographic locations. But after over two years, Madam Speaker, the government has only recently released a national action plan with no implementation strategy. Not only has the government not acted on the calls to justice, but it was unfortunate listening to our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, came, when he came out saying that he sees, in quotes, no path for basic income. I just want to remind the Honourable Member she's not to mention the Prime Minister by name. Sorry. Sorry the Honourable Member. Speaker, uh, which goes directly against calls to justice 4.5. And unlike this bill, the motion that I had put forward, Motion 46, which I introduced last summer, was very clear that a permanent guaranteed livable income would not cut our social safety net, rather add to it, as stated in paragraph five of my motion, in quotes, in addition to current and future government public services and income supports meant to meet special, exceptional and other distinct needs and goals. This is not clear in Bill C-273, that the option to get our social safety net is not on the table. A particular concern is Article 3D1, which states, in quotes, the potential of a guaranteed basic income program to reduce the complexity or replace, or replace, existing social programs to alleviate poverty and to support economic growth. Leading experts on guaranteed livable income, Madam Speaker, have been very clear that basic income programs are not a silver bullet and basic income must not replace our existing, existing social safety net. Rather, it must be in addition to our current and future public services and income supports that are meant to meet special, exceptional, and other distinct needs and goals rather than basic needs. It needs to build on our current guaranteed income programs, Madam Speaker, that are no longer livable, like old age security, the child tax benefit, and provincial income assistance, and expand them out for those who are falling through the cracks. When you leave people without choices, you place people at risk. Poverty costs lives. Poverty kills.
So there is no reason. There is no reason why anyone living in Canada should be destined for a life of poverty. This is especially the case given, given that we continue to witness billions of give, dollars gifted by the current Liberal government to subsidize corporations, including the $18 billion in the past year to big oil and gas. This government has also failed to go after offshore tax havens and companies like Loblaws who have profiteered off people suffering during the pandemic and have cut pandemic pay for frontline workers. The pandemic has only made the dire situation of poverty for individuals worse. We must prioritize people and the collective well-being of our communities, families and individuals over corporate privilege. We must move to forward towards a future where all people in Canada can live with dignity, security and human rights. This future is possible. It is simply a political choice. I would like to congratulate the member on this historic step today. I am pleased to see her moving this conversation about basic income forward and I look forward to working with her to improve the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Malpec. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm uh, pleased to speak on private members bill C-273, uh, an act to establish a national strategy for a guaranteed basic income sponsored by my colleague, the member for Davenport, and who's also a, a colleague on the, on the Finance Committee. Uh, I congratulate the member for Davenport for putting into a legislative format what has been discussed for years. In fact, uh, various concepts of a basic income guarantee have been attempted over many decades. But for one reason or another, there, there is less than complete documentation on how those systems worked or if they were even completed. There was the program that was mentioned by another speaker in Dauphin, Manitoba in the 1970s, which were, yes, different times, but data is really not available in a substantive way. The most recent trial, at least in this country, was the Ontario Basic Income Pilot, which was brought in as a pilot project by the previous Wynne government, which was then cancelled by the incoming Ford government before any results were known. I think there was a lot of hope in that project that it would give us a, a baseline of how, how a guaranteed annual income would work. Bill C-273 does not pre preconceive what is the best or the perfect basic income approach. But the bill sets the stage to try different pilots, to attain data in real time, to monitor results, and basically pushes the federal government to provide leadership in this national strategy. The uh, Bill C-273 would require the Minister of Finance to develop and table a strategy to, uh, to assess implementation models for a guaranteed basic in pro income program in Canada. And so, Madam Speaker, what the, what the summary of the bill and what the bill is really saying is there could be different models. Uh, the government would be responsible for assessing them, for, for attaining the data. The, da the act would require development in consultation with key stakeholders, including industry, indigenous communities, and governments, as well as municipal, provincial, and territorial governments. So uh, I, I heard some of the other speakers uh, uh, on this bill who some are opposed. Uh, my uh, my good uh, my good friend from Joliet uh, is saying, who uh, was also a member of the finance committee, is you know is saying, well, this would require a constitutional amendment. Not so. Uh, this concept could vary from province to province, but what we really need uh, is the data to assess whether or not it really works, as well as some people would say it will, uh, or or not, and so. There'll be all kinds of consultations and the federal government is required to do that under this bill. The act outlines specific measures the, stra the, st the strategy must contain, including a pilot project, national standards, and measures for the collection and analysis of relevant data. And I think, Madam Speaker, that is what is key. You know, <laughs> you... <laughs> Uh, in fact, I talked to a friend on the weekend, and he says to me that 
well, look, a guaranteed annual income, it's just going to be like Curb was. Uh, people are not going to be wanting to work. Um, well, uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. People may improve their education. They may go for better jobs. They may look for better paying jobs. Uh, but I'm willing to, uh, as one who's a strong supporter of, uh, of a guaranteed annual income approach, I'm willing to, to put my beliefs on the line. I believe it will work. I believe people will still want to work. I believe it will address the poverty issues that we have in this country. And I'm willing to say, let's do a pilot. Let's put our beliefs on the line. Those who are opposed, oppose the bill and say, look, it'll be a waste of money. They'll spend it on drugs, whatever. Uh, put, put your belief on the line and let's, let's actually do a sincere pilot where we collect the data in real time uh, and prove one way or the other. That's where I think we should be going. The minister at the end of the, the, the program would also have to prepare a report on the results of implementation two years after the tabling of the strategy. And I think that's really, really important. Let me turn to uh, 3A uh, in the bill. It states, establish a pilot project in one or more provinces to test models of implementation of a guaranteed basic income approach. Uh, I come from a province, uh, Prince Edward Island, Madam Speaker, uh, that has been, uh, that has uh, showed a willingness at the provincial level to uh, have the province as a whole uh, be one of those uh, pilot projects. The member for Charlottetown and, I, and myself have met with uh, counts, uh, countless uh, groups on uh, the guaranteed uh, income approach. And I think this province would be absolutely ideal for a pilot project. You know, you have the province as a whole, uh, you have communities, you have bigger communities, smaller communities, you have rural, you have urban, you have hospitals, you have schools. Uh, and only 158,000 people. Uh, so we could do a pilot over time uh, here. And there's the willingness, I think, on the on the provincial, I know on the provincial side, they've passed a, a motion in the legislature. There's the willingness there to work with the federal government to attempt one of those uh, pilot projects. And that's really what we need. That would provide the evidence uh, to show whether the system works or whether it doesn't. Point to D in the member's bill says, collect and analyze data for the purpose of assessing for each model tested. That's where we need to be. We need to do the pilots. I would suggest do three across the country, uh, maybe try it. Uh, I, I know there's some interest in BC, but if we could do and maybe in an urban area, a big urban area as well, but do the pilot projects, monitor the data, assess it, and then we all as members of parliament, regardless of what our position is, would have the concrete evidence in real time based on data that has been, that has been monitored on how it in, impacts people, how it impacts their health, how it impacts their income, how it impacts the community, how it impacts people in the workforce whether people are willing to go to, uh, to work or not, well, it, whether they're willing to increase their, their education and look for more high paying jobs. That's the kind of information that we need, Madam Speaker. And that's what, uh, I, uh, what I really like about this, this member's bill. It does not, it's got, doesn't have any preconceived notions. It's saying do the experimentation. I want to close, uh, Madam Speaker, by uh, mentioning uh, former Senator Hugh Siegel. Uh, he's uh, quoted the, 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 uh, an article by uh, Jamie Swift uh, in the Whig Standard, talks about his book, Bootstraps, Boots Need, Boots Need, uh, Bootstraps Need Boots, uh, One Tory's Lonely Fight to End Poverty in Canada. Mr. S Senator Siegel has long been an advocate of guaranteed annual income for dealing with the poverty issue in Canada. This is a way to find out if it really works. Thank you, Madam Speaker.